My name is Monk Rowe and I'm for the Phileas Jazz Archive. I'm very pleased to have Nick Mandela with me today. And uh, it's sort of 10.30 a.m., not really jazz hours, but welcome. Monk, thank you so much. And uh, thank uh, the Phileas Jazz Archive and Hamilton College and Joe Williams up there in the great 52nd Street in the sky, like Bill McCann likes to say. Yes. Thank you so very much. I'm really privileged and humbled. Normally, I would say uh, a list of what musicians do and, you know, what their gig is. But because you're a guy who works with words a lot, I'm going to offer you the a chance to introduce what your life's work has been. Wow. Okay. Um, I am, uh, for lack of a better word, a... Uh, freelance trumpeter, primarily a jazz trumpeter, uh, who also uh, is uh, able and uh, does a lot of work uh, writing. And uh, that extends into some other activities, which sort of is a logical progression, sort of like the 251 of life. Mm -hmm. But that, that kind of uh, moved into uh, consulting, uh, production consulting and creative consulting and uh, other things, book consulting. Uh, it's kind of like um, someone said to me one time, what is it that you do? So I says, I'm kind of like uh, Monty Rock the Third from the old Tonight Show. <laughs> what do you do? I'm a celebrity. That's what he used to say. Either that or I'm like the banana man, you know, from Captain Kangaroo. But I do a lot of different things in, in the jazz world and some things outside of the jazz world as well. And um, I have an awful lot of fun. In, uh, in most cases, it's a labor of love. And uh, like I uh, like I say, things seem to lead on and on and on. There's always something. It's sort of like, you know, those domino videos you see on YouTube, you know, that one leads to the next to the next. And it keeps me pretty busy. And uh, I really, really enjoy doing what I'm doing. I teach as well online and uh, in some cases in person and clinics and just a little bit of, uh, of everything. But right now, I would say predominantly I'm working in, uh, in my writing and uh, consulting work. Would you think, uh, would all those dominoes <laughs> have started and fallen into place if you have, hadn't been a player first? Uh, and what I mean by that is sometimes I'm fascinated by people who are tremendous fans of the music, or they make a uh, living as a perhaps a jazz journalist, but they weren't players first. So did your trumpet playing lead to all these things? Great question. Uh, and I did think about that. I'll be honest with you. I thought about that before this interview. I've been truly, truly blessed uh, to come from a family not so much of musicians, although there was some, two of the paternal great, 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 whatever back in Italy were bandmasters. And uh, when I was a youngster at about five years old, one of my uncles was a, a student of Doc Cheatham. He was a, uh, a semi-pro uh, trumpet player. But here's the thing, there was always pervasive music in the household. Predominantly from the, the women singing. So you grow up hearing all of these Sophie Tucker tunes and Fanny Bryce tunes and tunes from the 20s and whatever. Uh, and my father, he knew Al Jolson. That's how far back he went. OK, so in his case, it was always all of the Al Jolson tunes, Avalon, Sonny Boy. As a matter of fact, Sonny Boy was one of the first tunes I remember as, as an infant. So there was always this um, music 
musical environment all the time. So it was almost a logical progression that music would take hold in some, in some capacity, whatever it was. So having an uncle that played the trumpet, somehow I got a trumpet. I don't recollect how. Uh, it certainly wasn't like Clark Terry with the hosophone, but uh, uh, I uh, started lessons with an old time uh, trumpet teacher named Felix Sanginito, uh, who's taught a number of very, very fine players, uh, 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 including, um, I'm trying to remember his name. Uh, it'll come to me in a second. But he's taught a lot of guys, especially here on Long Island. So it was very much a progression. It was almost like no one forced you into this, but it was osmosis, okay? <laughs> you know, um, you know. I, I tell people the DNA is five lines in four spaces, and it was always like that. So... <clears throat> uh, you always were involved in the school band and what have you. Uh, so, and again, shortly after that, um, things started to open up outside the family. They used to take me around as a little kid uh, playing at things like uh, weddings. You know, let's bring the little kid up and have him play, uh, you know, uh, uh, Come, come back to Sorrento or something like that, you know, like uh, what Frankie Avalon did in, in, in some of his uh, video clips, right? So you'd be playing these Italian weddings uh, as like, you know, bring the kid up, you know, let him, let him do his thing. And of course, there were no smartphones or video cameras back then. Right. So you did that kind of thing. And then they'd bring me, I remember taking me around to like political uh, get togethers, you know, for this guy's running for mayor. Let's have this kid come and play whatever. So we got a couple of Italian votes. Yeah. So, you know, and then, then, like I say, things started to move outside, um, uh, outside of the family, but it was reinforced by the family. So when you're playing at these Italian weddings and so forth, do you recall the first time you played something on your trumpet that I, uh, was spontaneous, that was perhaps the forerunner of improvising for you. That was always there in some way, shape or form. It was always there. Some of that emanated from copying or imitating hearing that particular song uh, some of it was clams, okay, <laughs> you know, but uh, maybe a lot of it was clams. Hey, he's got Scongeli in his comeback to Sorrento, you know, <laughs> but um, uh, the improvisational thing was another thing that was picked up from the listening, from the records, Doc Cheatham. Uh, and then I remember um getting sheet music of rex stewart solos rex stewart cornet solos that were transcribed and i think my uncle had given given them to me uh so it was it was sort of like another kind of natural creative shtick you know and it sounds like you eased into it and so that you weren't afraid of it. I know um, I taught a lot of junior high kids and the, and the idea of improvising was frightening. And I think it's partly because they didn't have that experience you're talking about, that the music was around them. Very, very good point. I see that and have seen that in my years teaching. Um, I've always felt that younger students uh, have an innate creative ability to what we would call improvise in, in many different ways. Uh, you see that in artwork, you see that uh, in their speaking, uh, 
Um, the, the thing about offering jazz improv, quote, quote, to let's say a fifth or sixth grader, okay, uh, is it can be, as you say, very, very intimidating. Students at that, and you know this, at that age, you know, they, they don't want to be ridiculed and then they don't want to be uh, heckled. Uh, however, um, once you can ease that hesitation, and there are ways to do that that you kind of learn over the years, okay? Uh, now, you're not going to have a sixth grade kid, you know, improvising, you know, like John Coltrane, okay? Unless your name is Clovis Gragnox over in Switzerland. I don't know if you've ever seen him. I have not. Oh, you got to check him out. Uh, and I mean, this, this kid, and I had an opportunity to profile him. Uh, he literally, uh, he's a savant and he's learned bird solos, Coltrane solos, Dexter Gordon solos, mm. note for note. And he's done it this way. Okay. Uh, he doesn't follow the, the process of looking at a transcription, playing the notes, and then, then, you know, he goes the other way, which is, which is of course the way a lot of older players ha have learned, you know, but um, I'll, I'll tell you as an educator, one little trick uh, that I've used with a lot of success. And, and the thing about it is that once the kids do that, hey, man, look at me. This is pretty cool. I just played along with, you know, you put on an Abasol mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, some some YouTube downloaded uh, backing track. Uh, maybe it's just like a, a rock guitar with a rhythm section. And uh, you give the kid two notes, a G and an F, okay, uh, on the horn. And then, you know, I pick up the horn. You play, you play those two notes. The kid plays it. No music. Then you embellish the two notes. And then that two notes becomes a little more involved rhythmically. And you try to keep it within the technical abilities of the student, uh, which is, of course, the teacher's responsibility. And then you tell the student, you know, you know what you have done? You have just played jazz. You have just improvised. OK, and then you and again, this is, you know, things that have worked. I mean, there are things that I've done that just fell flat as a flat tire. OK, but you want to you want to get the child or uh, the student uh feeling confident about having done something in a very small way exactly and then it just it just goes on and on and on from there and um when you when you get the i don't know what to play comment okay well try to play what i'm going to play for you and then, of course, from the two notes to the three notes to maybe a, a version of a scale. No, don't get into any theoretical circle of fifths and anything like that, because then you wind up with the intimidation. And oh, my God, it's like the periodic table of the elements. <laughs> you know, I right. can't I can't handle that. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. So. Um, it's a it's a very 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 um, deep point uh, that over time, and this is one of the blessings about getting older. After a while, you try things; they work, they don't work. You bomb, and um, you get the kids. Another thing like that is um, I don't primarily like to teach from the method books, okay? Now, every student at some point in time when they're in the school, you know, they're gonna get the Bellwin band builder or the this or what have you, okay? So there are concepts that I embellish or I take from the Bellwin band builder, let's call it, or whatever it happens to be, and I write tunes for the kids, okay? 
And then, of course, you make silly names for the tunes, like Parade of the Peppy Pickle People or something stupid like that. And it's all about entertaining, because we are entertainers by our nature. It's innate, say, okay, we happen to be teachers. And entertaining, encouraging, motivating, and then being prepared for when when failure happens, you know, with, with the kids. You know, it's it's something interesting, and I hope I'm not running on on this, but when when you hear, you know, teachers say, you know, I asked this kid about Charlie Parker, and, uh, you know, he didn't know anything about Charlie. Well, the kid's a sixth grade or a seventh grade or whatever grader he happens to be. You know, it's our job to at least introduce not only who and what, when and where, but why. Why, why Charlie Parker? Why you know, why Dizzy Gillespie and all, why the great vocalists, you see? Yeah. And getting, getting them to buy into that, once they do, you know, they say, well, you know what, we trust this man or woman that's teaching us. And apparently, you know, he must know his, his stuff uh, or else they just grab them in from central casting, yeah. you know, <laughs> bring in a music teacher. Here you go. But, uh, you know, that's, that's a, a big, big, and I learned that. I'll tell you where I learned that from. Uh, I learned that from Clark Terry. Uh, I learned that from one of the great music educators out there, whose name you may or may not know, Paul Effman. Okay, Paul, a uh, music educator, came up with a, a model to... Uh, have schools in, uh, have music programs in private and parochial schools. And uh, eventually it developed into something like seven or 800 schools. Mm. But the idea was it's entertaining and educational and motivating and something that you will always, you know, try to remember. I'd like to come back to this later on when we talk about um, jazz education and where it's at, but I wanted to get to your, your writing, and I want to run by some adjectives by you. Oh, boy. <laughs> these, are, these are Nick quotes. Oh, Lord in heaven. <laughs> these are some things you said about different players, and um, Harmon muted Zatola buzzing, Korea fluttering lines, um, talking about a singer... Her approach to the lyrics is pristine and emotive and um, a tenor player who wails brazenly, energized entities. All these things um, were part of your descriptive writing on different recordings. So my question is, do you have literally, perhaps, a page of adjectives. <laughs> because, well, you know, you know, there's that famous saying, writing about music is like dancing about architecture. Right? Yeah, yeah, sure. Right. Well, I'm trying to think every time you sit down to write a review, and are you aware of using a particular phrase multiple times? How do you keep your writing fresh from one session to the next. Very interesting. Um, the writing aspect for me is, frankly, the easier part. That's number one. Uh, I really like to, when I'm doing, let, let's say it's a, a, an album review or, or nowadays a single review, okay? Um, I have a, process that I like to use, uh, which is not only repetitive, repetitive listenings. That's, that's number one. Um, I read the liners. Uh, when I do the listenings, I also, if, if I'm able to, I'll alternate the tracks. Okay. Uh, and I do that because sometimes there's a sequence in the production, 
all right, which is an art in and of itself from the production side, okay? Um, I'll alternate, I'll shuffle randomly and listen to the track again uh, on its own, okay? Um, stylistically, um, I do tend to, uh, in some cases, be a little Baroque with some of the verbiage, you know, a little embellishment. OK. Um, and, and that's a fine balance between talking specifically about the music itself and describing what my reaction is to uh, to the to the music or to the improvisation. And I don't want to make a supposition that you're going to have the same emotional reaction as I did. For a couple of reasons. One, I'm a musician, number one, which is a, a benefit. And in a sense, it's a little bit of a drawback. OK. Um, even though I've done a lot of the reviews, a lot. OK. Um, it's always a, a, a skill that I'm trying to get better at and to improve, just like just like playing the horn. OK. Um, but, you you know, you make a really good point. I noticed that in my own writing. OK. Um, the thing about the, the Glenn Zatola thing, which is really interesting. Glenn is a phenomenal, phenomenal musician. Yes. Incredible. OK. He's another Glenn is another savant. All right. Without without a doubt. <clears throat> and. Uh, when when Glenn plays, especially when he plays with that harm and mute, uh, he really gets almost that Miles Davis buzz. Okay, which is uh, actually it's a it's a aspect of physics. All right, the vibrations and the pitch, you know, have to be just right for that harm and mute to really zing. And he is gifted uh, here with his ear where he knows that he wants to get that Miles Davis type buzz sound from Miles' earliest days, you know, from the prestige recordings, If I Were a Bell and, you know, some, some of those great, great classic recordings. Um, uh, but, you know, the, the verbiage... Again, I try to keep that from both a trumpet player musician perspective and a writing perspective. And hopefully you get a good balance of the two. And <clears throat> uh, I have been criticized for being a little bit too embellishing verbally. Uh, and I'll admit that. Uh, and then again, that's something that one works on, you know, um, it's sort of like, um, how would Ernest Hemingway write this liner, uh, you know, liner notes or, or, or album review? Well, it's going to be pretty dry. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, you know, it's almost like the old dollar a word kind of commentary, you know, right? Like you're, you're, you're being charged a dollar a word okay um but <clears throat> i do i really really do my homework on the listening end do and you, then i yeah do you, um do you ever multitask when you're listening even even uh making coffee or oh, i gotta go get the mail and the music's playing or do you sit and just totally concentrate on, on the selection? Uh, I'll do that in the car. I like to do that in the car, hmm. uh, which is why I bought this car off lease because it still has a CD player. But uh, that's also part of the, of the uh, method of the madness. You know, I'll, uh, I'll listen to it here. Uh, and then I'll say, you know what? I want to take it for a ride. Um, I'll listen to it, uh, in a lot of different ways. I'll listen to a, a track and only listen to the rhythm section, you know, foregoing, foregoing the front line. 
I had a question about that. Uh, yes. Glad you said that. If you did a review on a record and let's say it was sort of in, uh, here we go with labels, but yeah. main, mainstream, I guess, and you were struck by how swinging the rhythm section is. Mm -hmm. For you, what makes that work? What makes that rhythm section swing more than some other ones? I think that swinging uh, in that particular instance is something that derives an emotional and rhythmic response from me, the listener, okay? Um, one can talk about before the beat, on the beat, behind the beat, you know, all of that technological stuff, but it's all about emotion. So <clears throat> um, uh, quite honestly, it'll be rare at least in my experience, where the rhythm section is really swinging and the vocalist or the front line uh, is, let's say, a little bit less energetic, okay? Um, you know, you, you, you have to look at a production in its totality, meaning the front line, the rhythm section, the engineering. Uh, I also like to listen to these albums or tracks from a production standpoint okay um and having done a little bit of that with uh with like keith fiala for example um uh, as a matter of fact i've done a lot with keith on a number of his uh, uh singles and albums uh you learn a little bit more i mean i i know nothing about you know, sliding and equalizers and phasers and all of that. All I know is what I can hear here. And you know what good balance is and you know what good mixing is. And you appreciate the production elements and the production values of what goes into the artwork. You know, it's almost like, and there are samples of this, um, it's almost like a beautiful classic painting that has a gaudy, gaudy frame. Okay. And it's like, well, I'm interested in, in you know, the, the Mona Lisa. I'm not interested in this, you know, gilded, you know, peeing cherubs and God, whatever it happens to be, you know? Yes. Um, so it, it really is an immersion. You know, you really immer immerse yourself um, into, you know, that's why um, I get on the album review side a lot of albums, you know, to, to listen to. Um, and, uh, you know, I tend to be very selective about what I'll listen to. Sometimes that, that that's not a, uh, not a positive Mm -hmm. Because you'll miss something uh, or you won't won't uh, review an album that really, really is something unique and special. If you've got a, a CD or with multiple tracks. Yes. You put something on and it just strikes you as I don't I don't enjoy this at all. Uh -huh. Do you go to track two and give it another try? Uh, and so this is a multiple question. Multiple sure. Question: If if you um, are requested to review something mm -hmm. and you really dislike it for specific reasons, do you review it anyway? Uh, in most cases, yes. Uh, I try to be fair. You know, I'll tell you something interesting. I see that more uh, in reviewing books. Okay. Uh, and I'll tell you why. Uh, and this drives me nuts. With uh, the proliferation of vanity presses, you know, anybody can publish a book if you want to spend the money on it, okay? So you'll get a book to review where the musician is just an awesome, awesome player. 
but they've used spell check. So you get uh, homonym words incorrectly in the spell check. Okay. And, and these are really egregious. Okay. Um, so you see that. Uh, other kinds, I mean, look, you're not reviewing the grammar per se. Uh, you are a musician. You're not an English teacher and an English expert. But at least from a production standpoint, okay, uh, use something, get a professional proofreader, you know, which I've done, okay, uh, to literally go through every word. I've seen that on liner notes, too, including where the main artist's name is spelled wrong. Mm -hmm. How about okay. saxophone spelled wrong? Bingo. <laughs> okay. I mean, we've seen it all. But again, you know, th th there's a couple of real interesting things there. One is uh, there's a tendency in the production cycle, and I've seen this, for the artist who was so eager to get the album done and get the album out, okay, that certain things tend to not get as much scrutiny as, let's say, the musical side of it. So I'll say to, a, I'll say to an artist or, or an author, uh, look, you, if you were doing an album, you wouldn't want clams on your record OK, I mean, really bad clams. OK, uh, not just improvisational type clams. OK, why would you allow why would you want them in your book? Give you another example. A, and by the way, some of these books were terrifically written, terrifically, terrific albums, terrific books. OK, and terrific albums. Another one. Literally, I'm reading the book. And the book literally comes, it decomposes in my hands. Now, wait a minute. What did you use? You know, the production facility. What did they use? Crazy glue? Okay. I mean, literally, the pages fall apart. As a matter of fact, I just sent a book down. I won't, no names. I sent it down to Jay Florida. And he said, what the hell did you do with this book? There's rubber bands all around, you know, I said, well, when you read it, you got to like hold one page at a time because they use such an inferior production facility. But the book is wonderful. It's great. Um, so that's something that that you encounter more so uh, in the book side of it, you know, um, I, I don't want to make this like a plug, but I'll give you a really good example. Uh, Joe LaBarbera, who I know you you know, and you interviewed yes. all three of my dear brothers. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, they He did a book with Charles Levin on Bill Evans. Which, which I'm currently reading. It's a great, great, great book. And the thing that, that they did was they... and. Charles was basically the production consultant. He's a former drummer, too. OK, um, they went to North Texas State Press. Mm -hmm. All right. The, the book and my daughter's a librarian, so she knows about books. And I showed this book to her and I says, this is really well manufactured. Of course, the book was written incredibly well. It's a great, great, great book. OK, but. They were wise enough to to take control over the production. Yes. Okay. Of of the book, so I see that more more so on on the book side than on the album side. <clears throat> but uh, you know, most of what I see album wise, you know, is 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 good good, and then up to great to phenomenal quality. Were you a, um, it's a bit of a tangent, but when you were growing up, were you an avid reader of LP liner notes? Um, yes, although uh, I was an avid reader of everything, everything. 
the if you you know if you look back to liner notes back in the day uh in more cases than not the liners were pretty top of line they really weren't uh you know as exhaustive Let, let's say something like what bill evans did for kind of blue okay because he was involved of course in the recording too um but uh, I would read them. You know, who's the personnel? That was always a big thing, too. Me too. Put... You had mentioned before we were recording how right. the tangents in the music world and how it's all this connection. And I remember seeing, oh, oh, Clark Terry's on this record and he was on that other record. And all these just like uh, musical chairs, I'd have to say. Without a doubt. Um, one of the things that I enjoy doing, I'm sure you're familiar with Tom Lord's jazz discography. So, which is a great, great, great resource, uh, especially for, an, you know, a historian or a writer or what have you. But it's always interesting to go in and plug in a name and go back to their early days. Okay. I, I did this recently again with Manny Klein who was a great, great, great trumpet player, great guy, great sense of humor. They'd always make fun of his nose. He made fun of his nose, you know. But you go back and you find out that Manny Klein played on all of these records from the 20s. This is before he went to Hollywood, you know. And in the same ensembles, you see Tommy Dorsey, Jimmy Dorsey, you know, other great names, Benny Goodman you know, that just went on. The synchronicity thing uh, also, you know, there's a lot of chance uh, in the larger sense of the word in the jazz world. Somebody, it's, it's like Lou Gehring with the guy, you know, that couldn't play first base that day. You know, a guy can't, a person can't make a gig, all right? They get a sub and before you know it, if not subsequent to that, but when, the vocalist leaves that group and goes on to another one. Boom, he plucks up, you know, that player. Um, so there, it, when, when you go back and you study, look at, if not study this stuff, um, you see all of these um, sort of random meetings, events. It's like the gal that got, discovered at Schwab's pharmacy in Hollywood. I forget who it was. All right. But but that kind of thing is absolutely fascinating. And and I, I mentioned before we were recording live, I'm doing a a, a a thing now on the comedian Soupy Sales. And a lot of people don't know he was a great jazz lover and he had a radio show in Detroit in the 50s and the theme song was uh, Yard Bird Suite and Bird was on the show three times and Miles was on six times, Errol Garner, Youssef Latif, okay? And I happened to be talking to Pete Beauty, and I mentioned that I was doing this thing and uh, Pete says, oh yeah, he says, I knew Soupy from before uh, in Toledo. We're all friends. We've been, you know, together the whole nine yards. So you have all of these sort of like circles. It's sort of like a Venn diagram, yes. okay? You know, all of these things, all right? And then in some way, shape or form, they come together. I'll tell you another one that was really fascinating. Um, Chuck Finley who I'm sure you know, one of the great, great, great musicians and great people. I love him. Uh, uh, he put something up on Facebook about his uh, wife's grandmother, apparently was a singer. So I thought this was kind of interesting and I would kind of scratch the surface. And the singer's name was Pilar, Arcos, A-R-C-O-S, okay? And uh, Zeely, Chuck's wife, that's her grandmother. So anyway, I start researching Pilar Arcos, 
And as the dominoes fall, one thing led to another. And you find out, if I recollect correctly, uh, she came to the U.S. by way of Cuba, although that's not where she was originally from, I don't think. I don't remember that part. Came to the U.S. and uh, was a vocalist. And in the 20s, with the advent of, I guess, 78s, she was one of the foremost recorded artists in New York, or if not the U.S. And there were all of these recordings, primarily in Spanish, all right, that she sang and was extremely famous. And she studied with a voice teacher and the person who would follow her or precede her in her lesson was Carlotta Monti, who was W.C. Fields' girlfriend. <laughs> so, and then of course it went on to Hollywood. Pilar went on to Hollywood with I Love Lucy and, and Ricardo Montalban and Cesar Romero and all of these other people. But the crazy thing about these things is that it's all this in some way shape or form yes. it, whether it's the hand of god if you think that way as i do or pure chance you know this is how a lot of things have have happened and um when you kind of dive in you know which is really the fun thing you know, I must have been like a a, 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 a dachshound in the in the, a prior life, you know, trying to rat out the, the rats. But when when you start researching this stuff, and you turn a page and turn a page, and it's absolutely amazing, you know, um, and it has impact upon the artists, and it has impact upon the artists' music which as a, a reviewer gives me more ammunition, so to speak, in terms of what the artist is all about. I you know? totally agree um, you know? that you're being faithful to the, you, this person's personality if you happen to know them. And I, and I agree that uh, you, this music isn't made in a vacuum. That's right. Yeah. And how. Yeah. And how. Um, I did a thing recently. Th this was another crazy project um, on a trumpet player by the name of Rocco Bene, B-E-N-E. -E. Now, I happen to remember his name uh, because in around Philadelphia, uh, Rocco was like the guy, the lead trumpet player. So like in New York, you had Bernie Glow. And in Philly, you had Rocco. And of course... In L.A., you know, later on, you had Al Pacino and some uh, Wayne Bergeron, of course, all these great, 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 tremendous, tremendous players. So I decided to research Rocco. And um, I knew about Rocco doing uh, a lot of the um, Gamble and Huff produced uh, Philadelphia international sides. But I didn't know about... Uh, the music scene in Philly uh, in which Rocco played before all of the uh, Cameo Parkway records, you know, Chubby Checker and, and Little Leva Locomotion and uh, Fabian. Uh, but the crazy thing, you know, you keep going, you find out they all went to high school together. Oh. South Philadelphia High School. All of them. All right. And Cameo Cameo was upstairs from a jewelry store. The recording studio was upstairs and it was like bare bones. They had the mic, the microphone for the piano was in the upright piano. And all of these Cameo, Jackie, well, you know, uh, Chubby Checker, right? The record for Cameo. And the guy that owned the jewelry store said, you know, I know a guy who uh, is a producer on this relatively new TV show. Do you mind if I kind of mention it? It turns out that the guy was 
friends with one of the producers on Dick Clark's American Bandstand. I knew that was coming. <laughs> yes. All right. So the guys from upstairs on Cameo, Fabi and Chubby Check, all right, they all wound up progressing, you know, onto, onto the other thing. But, you know, if you, if you dig uh, uh, a little bit and you research, and there's something about research that I'd like to add as well in a second. If you really dig, you know, you find out that these are important connections and important synchronicities, okay? Um, the, the thing about research that in today's day, day and age, and I'll make you laugh on this too, is there's so much information out there. And verifying the information, confirming the information is, is really critical. And uh, just like the in the book production thing, you don't want to have clams and use spell check. You know, you want to verify, you know, what your sources are or what have you. So um, as a humorous way of, of showing what, what happens today, a number of years ago, All About Jazz asked me to do a April Fool's spoof review. So what I did was, I've always been a Pee Wee Marquette fan ever since I met him at Birdland. Uh, which, by the way, through the good graces of Jay Florator and his father and his mother, uh, without whom I would never be here, forget about where I am. Uh, so Pee Wee Marquette, right? So I write this thing called The Lost Introductions of Pee Wee Marquette. <laughs> okay. And it was a spoof. And I incorporate the Lester Young thing and the tips and the, you know, the name Art Blake. Okay. Right. So anyway, I, and All About Jazz publishes it with a, with a number of other spoof articles for April Fool's Day. Okay. Well, a few years later, uh, I still was interested in Pee Wee, of course. Whatever happened to Pee Wee? You know, and then I found the the video clip that he did with uh, David Letterman uh, with, with his Hawaii Kai outfit and all his medals and his hat and everything. And I kind of lost. There isn't much about him after that. But anyway, I'm on Wikipedia. And there on Wikipedia, there is a CD album called The Lost Introductions of... Pee Wee Marquette. Oh, Lord. Yeah, so dig this. So I get in touch with, with Wikipedia, and I write them, and I say it was a spoof. It's presented as a spoof. Please, you know, you don't want to have erroneous information on Wikipedia, okay? Please remove it. They wouldn't remove it. About six months later, I get an email from someone, uh, I think in India, who writes me and says, can you provide me the CD? So it just took on a life of its own. Yeah. Okay. It's out there and you can't stop it. That, that's right. Um, one of the other things, and I'd, I'd like to share this with you, is... Um, there's a wonderful, wonderful musician, incredibly talented arranger, composer. You probably know him. Uh, he teaches down in Dallas. Uh, his name is Giovanni or Gio Washington Wright. And uh, he's done tons and tons of transcriptions. I mean, he's, a, he's, he's a, a genius when it comes to that and playing. But uh, about two years ago, Doc Severinsen and his lady friend, Catherine Leach, Kathy Leach, Dr. Kathy Leach, came to me and said, you know, there's a lot of misinformation about there as relates who played what on different film soundtracks. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, would you be interested in working with Doc and I on uh, 
verifying some of this information and obliterating some of the hearsay and that which is not, you know, verified. What are you kidding? Do a book with Doc? So I engaged Gio. I engaged Jay Florida. Uh, Gio uh, being a historian and very knowledgeable about soundtracks. He also has access through the union to the actual contracts. Okay. So we have started to work on this book, which Kathy said to me, it may eventually become like a long, a long form article mm -hmm. on verifying who played what, when and where and who it really is. Okay. So we start the research, we start digging in. And I really got into this. Okay, because I'm a soundtrack fan, too. So we got into who played this on this soundtrack and whatever. And we even found out who played overdubbing for Sam Jaffe on Gunga Din. The bugle call? The bugle call. Oh, good. The, guy's, the guy's name was Charles Hamilton. And the way I got that was I was watching some old YouTubes of Gunga Din, Gunga Din, Gunga Din, right? And this woman comes on and she says, that was, that was my uncle, Charles Hamilton. He was a member of the RKO Studio Orchestra. So with Gio's help and Jay's help and Kathy's research, we went back into a lot of these films, even going back to um, some silent films that had recorded soundtracks on them. Okay. And again, this was, this was an enlightenment, seeing who played what on these, on these recordings. But I'll share something, and, and this is uh, something I have somewhat of an issue with, and it goes back to the idea of verification. I have actually shown the, the AF of M contract to other musicians, and it says right there, here's who is playing on this session, okay? Mm -hmm. They won't believe it. They won't believe it. So, you know, there's some, there's some, I don't want to say stubbornness or ignorance out there, but th this idea of too much information, unverified information, or in my case, spoof information out there, okay, you know, it can sabotage, you know, our history, our history, which is viable, the history of music, in, in this case, the history of trumpet and film. You know, mm -hmm. uh, but that's that's a long term project that we're having a, a lot of fun with. And my daughter, Amy, as I said, is a librarian. So she's able to get into um, as a professional. She knows about these databases and different things all around the world. And you can, you know, kind of uh, access legally. All right. Information about films recordings record dates so it's a it's really a lot of fun it's a labor of love wow that's fascinating have you ever had um someone propose that you write an article with a title something like is jazz dead oh boy you know every 10 year maybe less than that it seems like this shows up on the cover of downbeat or jazz yeah dead. And, yeah. And uh, it's something to write about. W would you take that on? Uh, I don't know. I, w I, I, w I would be 51 no, 49% maybe. Hmm. And I'll tell you why. Um, there has been a lot written about that, a lot discussed about that. Um, it, it is a, a philosophical question. Uh, it's a question that plays directly into jazz education. 
uh, it's a question that plays into uh, access to technology. Um, it is a very, very, very deep uh, question that quite frankly, I would, I would say, I don't care uh, to debate it. All I know is that it is a perennial art form that uh, is a Black American and American art form uh, that is still evolving. Not only is it evolving, but it's like a Mobius. It goes back, you know, Marsalis is, is marvelous about doing this, you know, going back to its roots, going back to its roots, you know, and then moving ahead and examining uh, different pathways that jazz artists have taken, you know, John Coltrane being one of, one of the um, most avid explorers, Thelonious Monk, and, and many, many, many others. So, you know, uh, I, I wouldn't go back and comment, you know, well, it smells that way, like, like you know, you hear yeah. people say, which is stupid. Um, but it's the kind of thing that, let's just say, I would have to take a long, long, long walk thinking about uh, if I would want to do it, uh, what, are, what are some of the factors, both positive and negative? You know, it, it's really interesting in the sense that, again, I, like I say, this plays to jazz education. Um, if jazz is dead, why are there so many great high school and college jazz ensembles, okay? Right. Uh, if jazz is dead, why are there still great schools like Berkeley and North Texas State and Miami and whoever else I forgot to mention, okay? Um, these uh, educational institutions uh, aren't just bringing in students under some kind of a false pretense. The other thing, of course, is the technological aspect of it plays a really, really, really big role. I'll give you a good example. Um, before the COVID, uh, I went to see uh, Randy Brecker, who's a dear friend, over at um, the resurrected my father's place. Uh, and uh, the feature artist there, it was Billy Cobham's group. And they were uh, literally reliving uh, these great Billy Cobham albums that Billy did with Randy, with Michael, God rest his soul. And Paul Hansen, the bassoonist, this was really cool. Paul Hansen, the bassoonist, played Michael's parts. <laughs> Okay, and you know, he's a great, great, great jazz bassoonist. I mean, he's a monster. All right, but here's my point about the technical. So Randy is playing, and he's incorporating, you know, all of these foot pedals, you know, that look like Sam Ash's uh, electronics. There's this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. And but of course, being the great musician that he is, he's using them in a very, very wise way. Point number one. Point number two, you have YouTube, TikTok, uh, in-home studio, in-home video. You know, literally anyone can incorporate recording video and audio and present it. So, I have, I have young students or new students when I was teaching schools and what have you. Uh, are you a TikToker? Yeah, I'm a TikToker. I have 900,000, you know, followers. That's like my, my grandson says. He's got like 900,000, okay? So I said to him, what do you TikTok about? He says, we TikTok about gaming or what have you. So I says, well, 
Do you ever think about TikToking about a song that you might have heard that really is kind of a remake of a jazz song or a song that's sampled from a jazz song, you know, like Cantaloupe Island? Yes, just thinking that. Okay. Or, uh, oh gosh, uh, the, the pop tune was Billy Don't Call That Number. I forget the, the, the uh, uh, they sampled a, another tune. Oh. But, you know, you say to the young student, well, that actually came from, you know, this here. And it goes back to that question about how come you don't know about Charlie Parker? Well, it's our job to tell you about Charlie Parker. Okay. Uh, it's our job to get you hooked on it. So if you're savvy enough as an educator and willing to go the extra, not even a couple of yards, if you're willing to go a couple of inches to bring the jazz experience into what the young students are doing, okay? Uh, I mean, that that is like the, the bait on the hook that catches the bass, you know? Um, another quick example. Uh, as I mentioned to you before, I don't like to use method books per se. You know, I, li I like to entertain. So I, I write these these tunes on finale. Uh, and over the years, I've written about 1,200 or so. Some of them are transcriptions, all right? Uh, and they're transcriptions of, let's say, a tune like Song for My Father, okay? So we, we put that song in the, in the uh, and, you know, they'll, uh, they'll I will um, uh, modify the tune to make it a little bit easier with the embellishments and the trills and what have you. Uh, and then we listen to the song. After, after we learn it and play it, you just played that same song, you know, that uh, uh, Lee Morgan played, mm -hmm. okay? And then you go on and you go on. You, it's a, you know what? It's almost like a seduction, okay? Uh, and, and once you got them hooked, and I'll, I'll share one other thing, and I hope I'm not just going on and on and on, running on here, okay? What I'd like to do is get students involved in things in addition to their school musical activities. Give you a good example. Trumpet players. Would you like to be part of Taps Across America on Veterans Day or Memorial Day? You'll be seen on YouTube, blah, blah, blah. Okay, we get them to play taps. Um, uh, we did a thing with the World Band for a documentary that I'm involved in, uh, an award-winning documentary. They've, they've won in Barcelona and in Charleston uh, already. The, that documentary is called Song for Hope. It's about Ryan Anthony, the late Ryan Anthony, the great Ryan Anthony, um, and his... Uh, uh, cancer and developing cancer blows, which all these trumpet players are involved in. Okay. But the, uh, they did a thing with the world band and uh, would you like to be in the world band? You're going to be part of 1300 musicians, pros, young players, classical players, whatever. And you get them involved in something outside of just the school environment. It's an amplification of it. The other thing about that, when we talk about jazz improv before, we talked about the hesitation and the trepidation, you know, to go ahead and play, right? Yeah. Well, they make their videos and they go out and, and they're performing. You know, it, it's no different than the talent shows that Jay Florida and I used to do when we were young kids. They used to take us around to the talent shows, you know? You've come a long way, baby. Oh, <laughs> let me, I, I will add one other anecdote. I'll make you laugh, okay? 
One of the first, this is talking about getting outside the schools. When I was a young kid, my brother played clarinet and he played up, up through high school. And then he became a, uh, a police officer and detective and, you know, top, top, top cop. Anyway, um, in those days, you could do this. But my mom and aunts, depending upon what year it was, would drive us around on Halloween to bars. And we would be in like a hobo outfit. And we had this old hat that somebody got from the Salvation Army. Right. And we, we knew one tune, which was basically, uh, you know, a, a blues type thing. Bum, 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 bum. Okay. Right. Okay. Like Joe Avery's blues. Okay. So we would go to these bars and, you know, the drunks, <laughs> hey, look at these two little kids. Oh, you know, they would throw money, you know. So believe me, in those days, it was a lot. Of, it was a lot of bucks. But one gig, we go to a, what we used to be a restaurant. It's right around the corner from here. And believe me, every time I pass it, I think of it. A really hoity-toity restaurant. So... You know, my mother says, well, why don't you go in there? It's a fancy place. There's people that got a lot of money. All right. So my brother and I open the door. We walk in and we just start playing. The maitre d takes the both of us <laughs> by the scruff of our collar, escorts us not in a very polite way out, and throws a nickel and two pennies at us and says, get the hell out of here. <laughs> well, that now I know what you made on your your first game. Yeah, yeah you know, but <laughs> but yeah, it's important to get the kids out and play. All right, that's the key. Uh, I'd like to wrap up with this is a sort of a curveball. No problem. We, you had mentioned um, technology, and at some point we mentioned seventy eights. So this is um, Body and Soul, Foxtrot, Coleman Hawkins, and his orchestra. Wow. I wonder if you can imagine, if you were writing reviews back in that time, what was this, late 30s, mm -hmm. if you think about that recording, what would you have, what would have been your entry point? What would you have focused on? Wow. Normally, I try to take some aspect of the recording and bring like a metaphor into it, okay? Uh, and then use that as a launch point for the review of the music itself, okay? So let's say, for example, um, Body and Soul. Body and Soul, uh, I believe, was written by Johnny Green? Yes. Heyman, Heyman uh, Green, there are four names here. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, I'm, now I'm just, I'm just doing a stream of consciousness, sure. okay? Uh, Johnny Green went to Harvard, okay? Uh, he's a very, very well-educated person. Maybe there's something there, all right, that can lead me into describing, at least initially, as an entree into this uh, revolutionary recording, okay? The other thing, that I would, I would also do was take somewhat of a comparative approach. Well, there were other uh, players, of course, before. Um, historically, what sort of influences might have been on Hawkins' style, okay, or guided him in that direction, that influenced him on this particular recording and his other recordings. So, um, 
you know, it's a hard thing to do right now. It's almost like what we said before about is jazz dead because there's so there's been so much written about it. So we would have to go back in the in the you know H.G. Uh, Wells time machine, you know, back to that recording uh, and and listen to it with virgin ears. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, but again, like I like I said to you before, I try to take a methodical approach to it, and believe me, there's lots of dead ends. There's lots of dead ends, but the focus there, and here are some other uh, uh, angles that I might be interested in. Um, what is the interaction of the rhythm section with such a revolutionary approach to improv? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, here's Hawkins, right? Uh, really embellishing and playing and, and, uh, you know, right, right from right from the get go of his solo. Well, how is that interacting with with the other players who may or may not be at at a while they're great players, they may not be uh, at a level of exploration that Hawkins was. OK, Indeed. so um, it's a really, really hard, you know, that that's an interesting exercise in analysis that's a really 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 good good question and a really good exercise uh and like like anything else sometimes you have to you know do exercises yeah you know fist yeah fist fit it into your schedule <laughs> well you know what um that's a possibility you know um you know to look at it from uh, virgin ear, so to speak, and virgin eyes. Yeah. Well, I've really enjoyed our conversation. Oh, uh, this has been wonderful. <laughs> Absolutely wonderful. Uh, I can't thank you enough, of course. And uh, both uh, Giacomo Gates, my dear friend, the genuine one. Yes, indeed. Uh, he, he, really, deal. He, he really digs that. And I call him that, you know. But uh, don't tell him this. I mean, he truly is a genuine artist, but I actually picked that up. I stole it from a can of Budweiser because I saw the word genuine. I says, you know what? That That's Gates. You know, Gates carries the torch, yep. you know, of, you know, the all of the Eddie Jefferson going all the way back yep. to Pops. Yeah. He's part of that Venn diagram. Ab without a doubt. Right. With, without a doubt. Um, thank Glenn Zatola as well, uh, my my savant uh, friend. Yes. Uh, thank you, Hamilton College, uh, Milton Phileas. Yes. And the endowment. Um, your your jazz archive and Hamilton College's jazz archive is something that, as we said before, that both young students and not so young students you know certainly would would benefit tremendously you know um i think that people we live in an audio visual world now so people you know TikTok and and you know twitter and all of that stuff you know having people observe those videos and you know i mean you got you you've done over 400 of them, right Yes. I mean, so that I mean, so that's a monstrous buffet, you know. So you know, you 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 do uh, a few at a time or one at a time, and you know things that are picked up, and uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful resource. And uh, I certainly can't thank you enough. Well, I'm glad you're part of it now. Thank you so very, very much. All right, I'll pause us here and we'll uh, say okay. goodbyes. God bless and bop on.